American Sniper has topped major best-selling lists and captured the American public's attention with Chris Kyle's fascinating tale. It all started with one SEAL doing his job, protecting his country, and continues with 1.2 million copies sold and a Clint Eastwood film adaptation. Many memoirs would sell their second kidney for that kind of attention. So, how did it happen? Our guest co-wrote the book and is here to tell us the whole story. Jim DeFelice, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on and sharing your afternoon with us. I feel like we already talked everything out before the show started. <laughs> oh, okay, well then, well, then you guys can talk. <laughs> I was I came in late, so everything's going to be fresh and new for me. So Yay. there we go. And fresh for the audience. <laughs> we have Corey and Patricia. They're here. Hi, good to see you guys. And more people coming on. Um, yeah, so uh, the first question I have for you is, how did this book get started, American Sniper? So early on in the book, Chris Cowie comes out and he says, you know, other people wanted to tell his story for him and he wanted to be the one who tells his story. But how did this become a book and how did you get involved with it? Uh, well, Chris actually didn't want to do a book. Chris didn't yeah. uh, at all. And um, the my editor at Harper, uh, Peter Hubbard had um, actually somebody else, another SEAL, had tried pitching a book to him, and in the process had you know, he had mentioned somehow had mentioned Chris or about Chris. I don't even think he mentioned uh, Chris's name, but um, but Peter decided uh, that oh hey you know this would be a really good this would be a really good uh, military story, because at the time uh, that's what what Peter was mostly doing. And um, so he called up Chris, and I think the first time he talked to him, Chris told him something along the lines of "get lost." Uh, then, then he, you know, tried called him again, and Chris said, uh, "You know what? I'd love to talk to you, but I'm going hunting on a hunting trip. Call me back in two weeks, and we can, you know, discuss it." Probably with the idea that he was going to blow him off. In the meantime, uh, Peter uh, called me and said uh, yeah would you have you ever heard of because i had been working with uh with dick marcinko who's a navy seal and um, was in the vietnam war and then started seal team six later on it's kind of the daddy of seal team six and some other um kind of still classified stuff at uh, you know at the pentagon and, and in the kind of the navy space of special operations and uh, so I you know, knew some people in that community, and he asked if I had ever heard of Chris, and I had not met Chris. I had heard a little bit about, about him, but I didn't know anything. And he asked if I'd be interested in, um, in doing, you know, working with, with him for a memoir. I had done uh, a number of uh, celebrity, actually celebrity um, memoirs. It's kind of a different beast. And, um, you know, and frankly, I, you can't tell an editor no. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can, but, uh, but basically I was going to tell them no. I had, I had a ton of stuff to do. Uh, you know, I was kind of backed up. And, um, but I told them I'll take the, yeah, I'll take the meeting, you know, which was a phone call. And then I guess Peter went to Chris, told him who I was and was interested and blah, blah, blah. And for some, for whatever reason, Chris took the phone call. And I, I would say, and I wasn't going to do the book uh, when I got on the phone. And within about mm, 30 seconds or so, I was like, I would have done it essentially for free. Uh, he's just like so sincere. And there were a couple of things that I, wanted to do that that you know, I told them up front um, that hadn't really been done uh, in hadn't really been done in uh, military memoirs uh, to the n not ever but I mean recently I mean most of them quite honestly at the time were total bullshit they're they're just kind of whitewashing everything leaving all sorts of details out um, and their crap and of course i just have just insulted a million people but they you know for various reasons they you know they were they weren't telling the whole the whole story, the whole story. so i wasn't interested in that and 
I told him that. And you know, Chris's response is, yeah, no shit, man. Of course, you know, what do you, you know, what else would we do? So that response. was cool. <laughs> right. And then the other thing I said uh, is that I don't want to just write about you. I don't want to just, you know, your family was part of this because you were deployed. By that time, I knew uh, a lot of his background and how long he'd been, you know, in the SEALs and in the Navy in general. And I said, and they're part of the story. And I so I want to talk to your, you know, I want your wife's uh, point of view. Uh, and his response was, yeah, that's a really good idea. I think that's really cool. And we had a, both of us had to work on her to, to get her into the book. She, she was very, very reluctant to, to, you know, to just to, to be involved. She's like, why, why would you even want me? And, um, you know, we kind of went from there and, uh, Chris, Chris would have been happy. The, the, the truth is, Chris would have been happy if, you know, the book came out. There were two copies, some dusty, you know, way back in the, the back room of the, of the store, you know, gathering dust. But that's, that's not what happened. So that's, that's kind of how I got involved. So with this phone call, neither of you wanted to do the book. <laughs> that's right. Where the that's phone right. call started, and then your pitch was, I don't want to write another crappy military memoir and also I want to get your family involved so let's turn turn kind of the risk factor up um like some some wives might hear that like or some family members might hear that like oh we're gonna tell the truth of what's going on behind the scenes and my name's gonna be in it and I'm gonna be in the public spotlight yeah. but that was the pitch and yeah uh, and that uh, you know, and uh you know, Tay, Tay eventually went along with it. We, uh, the first time we met, I mean, we talked a couple of times over the phone, but uh, the first time we met, we worked at uh, a friend of, now a friend of mine too, but a friend of uh, Chris's in uh, Texas had a had a ranch. I guess that not everybody in Texas had a ranch, has This ranches. one just happened to. <laughs> but this guy had, had one and he very generously uh, was the winner and let us, let us use the ranch for you know a few days and just hang out so we could work a little bit get to know each other work on the book and taya uh taya didn't want to come and uh chris they were in separate places chris had driven over first and chris talked to her on the phone for a, a while you know convincing her it's like oh you gotta come he's not you know he's not a total jackass you know he's total. yeah he's from new york but what the hey you know and come on, we'll hang out. And, you know, so she came and, um, and, you know, she was really reluctant. Uh, and I think we kind of, we, the, that night, the first, the first night, you know, everybody's just kind of sitting around BSing, you know, drinking and, uh, keeping the fire going. And then the, but the next morning, um, Taya actually got up and, and made us breakfast and kind of over breakfast, um, you know, she just, they just, they just both started opening up and to get, it was really, really cool to see a couple, like how they were, how they like kind of interacted. And you could like tell there's like, it's just like a certain way that people who are in love and like have this really deep connection. It sounds kind of hokey, just like talking about it, but if you were no, sitting, it, believe makes so me, much, it does. No, if you're sense. like sitting like there, like having uh, venison sausage and, you know, you just, you know, and countless pots of coffee, you know, you just, it just like came out. And I think after that, that she was a lot cooler with it. And, um, you know, uh, it was the stuff that happened, you know, afterwards in terms of being kind of thrown into the public spotlight. Certainly Chris was not prepared for it. And I don't know that it certainly Taya wouldn't, wouldn't have been either. Um, so I, I really love this approach, you know, like you think, you know, writing a memoir, you're going to talk to the person, you're going to write down some stuff, flesh it out. But you guys, you went the extra mile. You're like, we're going to spend some time together. We're going to actually like live under the same roof because that definitely gives you a whole other side to a person. Like you really get to know a person when you're under the same roof for an extended amount of time. You know, and because of that, you know, while Warble, <laughs> Robillard, there we go. Now I said it. Um, 
asks, what was the writing process like with Mr. Kyle? Because I would think, you know, having this more intimate time would definitely expand on what it could have been otherwise. Yeah. Um, the way that, yeah, I'm not interested in, um, yeah, how to phrase this without insulting people. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's the way I do it. I, you get like so much more information from people just by hanging out with them. I mean, we did obviously with, with Sniper, with all the memoirs that I've done, uh, you know, there's formal interviews and, um, a lot of times, essentially, we'd be going over the same thing a couple of times. But uh, to you really get like a much better feel for who the person is and what they really want to say just by being there, by going to the store with them, uh, as silly as that may sound, or going to meet their parents and driving, you know, an hour or whatever, uh, and then just hanging out. Um, or going, uh, going hunting with somebody, or or uh, shooting on a on a gun range, or or whatever. Uh, it's I really want that texture. I mean, what I see as my kind of role is to okay. So if this person had the you know the the skills and the gifts that I had that I ha am here for. What would they be? What would they be saying? How would they be, you know, presenting things? Um, and, you know, I've been lucky. I've been fortunate, not just with, you know, not just with Sniper, but with, you know, doing um, other memoirs, you know, to be able to spend a lot of time um, with, with people. And, you know, I tell them that eventually they're going to get sick of me, but, you know, that's the way the process works. And I'm usually a real pain in the ass after a while, but. God, you um, got to be, man. Got hopefully you it works. This, this... Oh, no, Kaylee's and you froze. Oh, no. Oh, uh oh. So, Jim, what what do you do? Like, um, is it two weeks or something that you, you're together and you, you just live life with them? No, it's as much time as I can, you know, as we can spare. Uh, you know, we in, in Sniper is Sniper, I guess, would be a decent example, at least of the process. Uh, we had, um, I guess, we started working. Oh, we definitely started over the phone, and you start with, um, you know, relatively easy stuff, background stuff. And one of the things that you're doing is trying to build up a rapport mm -hmm. because, you know, let's face it, this person. People don't, the person that you're working with, they don't know you. Um, right. I did uh, you know, a book that um, came out two years ago with a World War II veteran, Ray Lambert. Um, and then, you know, we spent, yeah, he doesn't, he's he, actually, he's 100 years old now. And, you know, he didn't know me from, you know, a hole in the wall. And, uh, you know, so you have to kind of build up, build up things, build up. Uh, you know, kind of a rapport. Mm. And so we start with, start over the phone, kind of getting basic information. Uh, also, there's research involved in my, you know, on my side, if it's, you know, whether it's, you know, Iraq, uh, the Iraq war, uh, that happened, I happen to actually have a lot of information having done several books on the Iraq war. Uh, and fiction set in the Iraq war. But even so, there's still a lot of information that, you know, that I had to find out. So you go into, you go kind of into the regular, more formal interviews with background and with what I would call an agenda. Uh, with Chris, after the, after those, you know, kind of the preliminary phone calls, we spent about, uh, we started doing formal interviews, which would be, which I would tape or, or um, you know, use on a voice recorder uh, or occasionally video, um, but that tends to be very distracting. Mm. Uh, so we spent about a week doing that, um, but I came back to New York. They came up for about a week shortly after that, and then I went down for another, I guess, about a week. Um, and then we, you know, and all of that time, those are all formal interviews. In between times, we're... We were uh, we would talk on the phone, uh, text 
can do a lot of text messaging. Uh, and not a lot of that's not necessarily interviews. I mean, you know, hey, what's going on? Oh, my truck just blew a tire or what, you know, stuff like that, that isn't going to get in the book, but is, you know, does tell you a lot about the person, um, you know, and then, then kind of after the formal interviews are done, as a general rule, I'll write, write a first draft of the book, which is what I did with Sniper. We'll end up with a million questions and uh, then kind of start doing some re-interviews. Uh, I should say like during the formal interview process, as a general rule, I'm going to go over everything pretty much at least twice and certainly things that <laughs> things I don't understand, I go over a lot. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, you know, um, and then, you know, when you're doing research in between, it was difficult. I didn't understand the Battle of Ramadi at all. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a lot of research. I ended up getting um, a lot of after action reports, which from a technical point of view, they're really, they're not important to the book per se, but they were important for me to understand and then kind of extrapolate and, and talk to him about. Um, so then after, after kind of the questions, filling in all the questions, then um, I'll typically give the draft, a draft of the book to my co-author, and then we'll, you know, we'll go over it and then we'll make it pretty. And then the fun starts. So. I, I love that you mentioned and then make it pretty. You're you're getting everything down. You're getting everything coherent. And then you make it pretty. And then we make it pretty. Uh, then we take out all my questions, uh, <laughs> some of the typos. I hope to get all the typos out. I have very good proofreaders. But uh, there are all the mistakes are mine, unfortunately. <laughs> so I, it's the only thing I can really take credit for, I guess. The buck stops here. Yeah, yeah, well. Well, I've I've helped a couple of authors with their memoir, and one thing that comes up pretty quickly is we've got all these great stories, but how do we organize them yeah. and figure out which ones need to stay in the book, like which ones are helping to shape the narrative, and then which ones aren't, and and to even figure out what's helping to shape the narrative, you need to figure out what your narrative is. So how did that process go with Chris, like figuring out what the unifying like theme is or the unifying idea so that you could actually organize these stories? Yeah, I try not to, yeah, you try not to pre prejudge the story until you actually know it, you know, and that's the, that's the thing. Um, I don't want to, you know, going into those formal interviews, say, you, on the one hand, you don't want to have you know, you don't want your head like to already to be like this. So you miss this better story in the whole story. On the other hand, you know, if you don't have some sort of guideline or some sort of agenda, then, you know, then you're going to be all over the place. I mean, people's lives, you think about it, the sniper four or 500 pages, whatever it is, it's longer than it was supposed to be, by the way, which is a problem of mine, a common feature, I guess I would say. I call it a feature, not a flaw. There you but, go. Um, but you know, even so, so 120,000 words. I mean, that's a, you know, that if you thought about what you do in a day or maybe a week, that's 120,000 words easy, right? So, you gotta, you gotta compress it down. And, um, you know, in Chris's case, at, at some point, I uh realized that the the kind of the best organizing principle, at least for me, was to organize it around the his four deployments in Iraq. And he did do some some things outside of those deployments. Uh, unfortunately, they're still, or certainly at the time of the book, and, and I know at least one of them is still, uh, well, a couple of them are still highly classified. Um, so those weren't going to get in the book anyway. Uh, but it helped to have those. And once I realized that there were four kind of discrete, um, you know, times that he was there, that did help, you know, kind of give, um, you know, give a lot of the, the backbone to it. In terms of coming up with, you know, kind of the undertones, the underlying, uh, you know, themes, which are, you know, always important. 
uh, you know, you look at it, or I look at it, the way that you know a fiction writer would look look at it. Okay, what you know, what really, what are the what's the underlying thing in this story of this person's life of the the experiences that are there? And we had certain guide, you know, I had certain guidelines. I wanted to get the family in, as I said before, because nobody had written about you know, the, the families of, of SEALs or other, you know, special operations uh, troops. And, and you know, they're the, well, mostly, mostly we're talking about wives, in a few cases, their husbands, um, but, or, you know, or, or loved ones. And uh, if you're not actually married, it's a little, it's even worse because you're not kind of on the, in the chain of notification for a lot of things. But, uh, you know, they, are actually sacrificing quite a lot, uh, especially the, you know, just regular military or quote unquote regular military, but, you know, military people, when they're deployed, they're away for a long time. And, um, you know, it's a little bit better now because you have more mass communications. But if you go to, let's say, World War II, uh, Ray Lambert, the actually is a medic, a fellow I was talking about before, uh, who he was in all of the big invasions uh, from Africa to, to D-Day. He, he had a child while, um, you know, his, his first child was born while he was in Africa. You know, they had, had you know, consummated their marriage, I guess, to be put a polite, politically correct term, I guess, uh, you know, before he left. And he found out, I, I think it was like six weeks later that, you know, that he that, you know, he was a dad, um, you know, now it's, it's a little bit better now. It's a, it's a little yeah. bit better now. A friend of mine who uh, was in Afghanistan found out that he was a father prematurely um, about 48 hours after his wife gave birth. So, and now I, uh, hopefully it's a little bit faster, but still you think about it, now that sounds terrible for the for you know for ray and you know for the for the fathers but imagine being you know the wife in in that case uh even if it's not a high you know risk pregnancy or something i mean what what is that person going through what what is the three-year-old going through you know and how do they figure out um you know mom is in charge and using chris's story mom is in charge while you know dad's away and then suddenly dad comes in and you know dad has these different ideas and, and vice versa so you know i think that that's kind of a, an aspect of it's an aspect of life certainly but certainly an aspect of war that we don't really think about yeah well you bring taya's story into the book you have sections where she comes out and speaks mm -hmm. and you give her um her honest take on it and sometimes her honest take on it is like, I was in tears. I was having yeah, a, yeah. a breakdown. Yeah. He calls me and he's, he, we're having our little touch in, our once a week, you know, kind of touch in. And then I hear gunshots and yeah. all of a sudden he has to leave. And yeah, it's nothing me, wrong. He's like, <laughs> nothing back. wrong. Yeah, everything's yeah. okay. Yeah. And then he doesn't, he doesn't, he isn't able to contact her for days later. And she's yeah. in tears because she doesn't know what happened or if he's, if he's okay or what um and that's part of that sacrifice that she's making absolutely and you kept those stories in i found that really really interesting that you kept kind of the pain in um you kept his voice when sometimes um he's saying something that's kind of hard or rough around the edges mm -hmm. and and you kept all of that that in the book I guess that goes back to wanting to have truth, like to tell the true story of what happened. Absolutely. So I turn the book in and uh, get the, the first call from Peter, from the editor. It's, oh, great book, blah, 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 blah. Uh, about this word savages, because <laughs> that's how Chris you know, thought about the enemy. And, you know, basically he wanted to, to, uh, P we'll call it PC it. And I said, no, that's absolutely how he felt. That's what the, you know, you want a true story. I don't know that he did, but he certainly does now. He may even think it was his idea, but, um, <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of pushback from, you know, from the publisher. Uh, but fortunately I think 
uh, you know, in the end, uh, he he agreed that that was the way to that was the way to do it to be you know truthful the whole way through, and he you know when I didn't tell him I was putting Taya in, <laughs> so I delivered it. Um, and I think that, it, you know, and again, we had a discussion about that. And, you know, fortunately, he's a very insightful editor. Uh, we've worked on a bunch of stuff. We had worked before this, we had worked on fiction only. And that's a kind of a different beast. Um, and since then, though, we've worked on a bunch of nonfiction together. And, you know, he's very... He's very diligent about what he does. I mean, was, I was researching. I wrote a book about the Pony Express. He, he's the only editor that I've ever had show up uh, while I was working on a book. Um, of course, it happened to be you know an interesting place to show up, but still, you know, usually you know writers. Let's face it, you know, you're sitting talking to yourself all day for many days in a row, so not really too exciting to hang out with writers at least not while they're working and uh but he he was good he you know he had some good uh, good notes and he's always had some good notes i've been very very lucky with uh, with him as an editor all right well so we've, far so, so far <laughs> we've picked out a selection of the book um it's from pretty early on and um when i started reading it i was like whoa this is so exciting this is one of the the stories really picking up he's you know in in Iraq, and it sounded just like some of the like the space opera, the <laughs> space marine stuff that I read. Only it's real life, so I thought, hey, we have to get Kayleen to read this. Cool selection. All right, so can you guys hear my mom giggling? No, <laughs> okay. not yet. That's that's why I muted it because like I thought she was crying. For... Anyway, that's the side note. Anyway, so yes, yes. So I um. I got express permission from Jim. I just want to say on the record <laughs> to be able to read this part of today's spotlight on American Sniper, the autobiography of the most lethal sniper in U.S. military history by Chris Kyle, Scott McEwen, and Jim DeFelice. I hope I said all those right. All right. And I will be reading Dune Buggies and Mud Don't Mix. <clears throat> Geared up and strapped in, I sat vibrating in the gunner's chair of the DPV shortly after nightfall, March 20th, 2003, as an Air Force MH-53 lifted off the runway in Q8. The vehicle had been loaded into the rear of the paved low, craft, low aircraft, and we were en route toward the mission we'd spent the last several weeks rehearsing. The waiting was about to come to an end. Operation Iraqi Freedom was underway. My war was finally here. I was sweating, and not just with excitement. Not knowing exactly what Saddam might have in store, we'd been ordered to wear full mop gear, mission-oriented protective posture, or spacesuits to some. The suits protect against chemical attacks, but they're almost as comfortable as rubber pajamas, and the gas ma mask that comes with them is twice as bad. Feet wet, someone said over the radio. I checked my guns. They were ready, including the 50. All I had to do was pull back the charging handle and load. We were pointed straight toward the back of the helicopter. The rear ramp was not all the way up, so I could see out into the night. Suddenly, the black strip I was watching above the ramp speckled with red. The Iraqis had kicked on anti-aircraft radars and weapons that Intel had claimed didn't exist, and the chopper pilots began shooting off decoy flares and chafed to confuse them. Then came the tracers. Streams of bullets arcing across the narrow rectangle of black. Damn, I thought. We're going to get shot down before I even get a chance to smoke someone. <laughs> Somehow, the Iraqis managed to miss us. The helicopter kept moving, swooping toward land. Feet dry, said someone over the radio. We were now over land. All hell was breaking loose. We were part of a team tasked to hit Iraqi oil resources, before the Iraqis could blow them up or set on fire, set them on fire as they had during Desert Storm in 1991. Seals and Grom were hitting gas and oil platforms, go plats, in the Gulf, as well as onshore oil refinery and port areas. Twelve of us were tasked to hit farther inland, 
in the all fall oil refinery area. The few extra minutes it took translated into a hell of a lot of gunfire, and by the time the helicopter touched down, we were in the shit. The ramp dropped and our driver hit the gas. I locked and loaded, ready to fire as we sped down the ramp. The DPV careened onto the soft dirt and promptly got stuck. Son of a bitch! The driver started revving the engine, slapping the transmission back and forth, trying to budge us free. At least we were out of the helicopter. One of the other DPVs got stuck half on and half off the ramp. His 53 jerked up and down, trying to desperately free him. Pilots hate like hell to get fired at, and they wanted out. By this time, I could hear the different DPV units checking in over the radio. Just about everybody was stuck in the oil-soaked mud. The intel specialist advising us had claimed that the ground would be hard-packed where we were going to land. Of course, she and her colleagues had also claimed that the Iraqis didn't have anti-aircraft weapons. Like they say, military intelligence is an oxymoron. We're stuck, said our chief. Yeah, we're stuck too, said the lieutenant. We're stuck, said somebody else. Fuck, we've got to get out of here. All right, everybody get out of your vehicles and go to your positions, said the chief. I undid the five-point harness, grabbed the 60 off the back, and, hump and humped in the direction of the fence that blocked off the oil fat facility. Our job was to secure the gate, and just because we didn't have wheels to do it with do it with didn't mean it wasn't getting done. I found a pile of rubble inside of the gate and set up the 60. A guy came up next to me with a Carl Gustav, technically a recoilless rifle. The weapon fires a badass rocket that can take out a tank or poke a hole in a building. Nothing was getting through that gate without our say-so. The Iraqis had set a defensive perimeter outside the refinery. Their only problem was that we had landed inside. We were now between them and the refinery. In other words, behind their positions. They didn't like that all that much. They turned around and started firing at us. As soon as I realized that we weren't getting gassed, I threw off my gas mask. Returning fire with the 60 I had plenty of targets. Too many, in fact. We were heavily outnumbered. But that was not the real problem. We began calling in air support. Within minutes, all sorts of aircraft were overhead. F-A-18s, F-16s, A-10As, even an AC-130 gunship. The Air Force A-10s, better known as Warthogs, were awesome. They're slow-moving jets, but that's intentional. They're designed to fly low and slow so they can put a maximum amount of gunfire on ground targets. Besides bombs and missiles, they're equipped with a 30-millimeter Gatling cannon. Those Gatlings chewed the hell out of the enemy that night. The Iraqis rolled armor out of the city to get us, but they never got close. It got to the point where the Iraqis realized they were fucked and tried to flee. Big mistake. That just made them easier to see. The planes kept coming, nailing them. They had them zeroed in and zeroed them out. You'd hear the rounds coming past you in the air. I hope I do these sounds right. Then you'd hear the echo. <laughs> followed closely by secondary explosions and whatever other havoc the bullets caused. Fuck, I thought to myself. This is great. I fucking love this. It's nerve-wracking and exciting. And I fucking love it. And that is that. Yeah, that's Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I embodied him a little bit. <laughs> well, I like this section because it brings out what people love about military memoirs, like to put you kind of in the middle of the action, mm. but also it's explaining the larger story and how, how this little battle kind of fits into the bigger operation, right. Iraqi yeah. freedom. So, uh, but I expect when Chris is talking to you, he's not bringing all of these elements in. Um, how did you, how did you as the writer do that? Yeah, well, that's uh, you know that's my job really is to yeah. to put it to put it into perspective, um, you know, to capture not just uh, the most important thing obviously is to capture his emotions and how he's feeling, and kind of the mix of ex you know really of excitement and what he's feeling at the, at that point, um, and you know he's 
it's first time in combat. It's a, it's a huge adrenaline high. Um, you know, things don't go as planned and blah, blah. And that's all, you know, and we talked through that, uh, you know, a couple of times. Then, um, you know, then details, then you add, you know, you add in things uh, like enough details about the, um, the military hardware, for instance, but also kind of the larger operation uh, that's that's going on. I knew that because um, the book is not just, I, I mean, obviously most of the book is about, or the primary goal of the book is to tell you what Chris's experiences were and what Taya's experiences were, but it's also to, to put the, uh, to some extent, to put Iraq, that whole war, at least the portions of the war that he was involved in, into some sort of perspective and to tell people who, uh, you know, who weren't glued to, uh, at the time, CNN uh, was carrying a lot of the news and weren't, you know, kind of glued to those shows, you know, to kind of give them context, in some cases to remind people what was going on. It, it happens that a section that uh, where where they were involved had not um, had not really gotten a lot of uh, publicity, I guess, or hadn't really been written about uh, for for various reasons. I mean, there were so many things going on. You know, you have to just pick one, and that wasn't the most important thing. Especially because had those, <laughs> it's funny, had those oil fields been blown up, you know, by the Iraqis, light as happened in the first gulf war it would have been a huge ecological disaster beyond what wars wars are always ecological disasters but it would have been you know even more extreme but because it wasn't that extreme because you know you didn't have that disaster you know it wasn't you know wasn't as important news so it wasn't being you know talked about and so we wanted to put that also into perspective um, and that perspective in a lot of cases, um, was supplied by me through, you know, through research. In this case, I happen to have known about that operation beforehand, but I still had to go back and, you know, get more information. And there's things like that, you know, throughout the book. It's a, it's, you know, it's a balance though. You can't, you don't want to spend, you know, people are not picking that book up to read, you know, how exactly the, what the difference between the Battle of Fallujah was, the second Battle of Fallujah, I should say, and the, you know, Ramadi was, and why there was, why it was different. Although we get in a little bit into that. Um, and, you know, they're picking it up to find out his attitudes. And, and so you kind of, it, it's, you know, it's different than writing, um, than writing a history of the war. It's very, you know, it's very different. Yeah, there's a lot you have to balance against because that larger narrative helps the reader understand Chris's story in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, like you said, it, the book was already, what, 100 pages? No, 100, 100 pages over what your target was? <laughs> well, it was, I, I, I forget exactly what it's published at, but I think it was, it was somewhere between 110 and 120, 120,000 words. Uh, and it would have been, I think that it was supposed to be like about a hundred. Um, but so. he's also trying to tell <laughs> the true story of what happened when there's another number of times when he comes home and he says something like, people don't understand what's going yeah. on over there. You know, they're watching the TV and the TV's got it wrong and, and their understanding is so different from my experience. So you're, you're trying to kind of open people's eyes to a, a new side of the Iraq war that yeah. they might have heard was completely different from yeah, what I think it's saw. Yeah, I, I think it's very frustrating for, and not just for Chris, but for, you know, a lot of uh, service people who have been, you know, they're in the war and they, you know, they experience things from, you know, the ground level and, you know, and then they come home and people people don't understand for various reasons. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, war, war is a really horrific, sucky, terrible thing. And, you know, and for various reasons, people are not, you know, don't, 
you know, it's, it's tough for us to face reality, unfortunately. And, um, you know, and that's one, one of the things that if, if I was going to say, look at the military, I write a lot of different things, but if I was going to look at the military memoirs that, that I've done, uh, from, you know, whether it's, whether we're talking about American Sniper or Every Man a Hero, which is about World War II or, you know, many of the other ones, um, you know, I'm trying to, we want to, uh, want to tell people to the extent possible, you know, you're not going to go to war. You don't, you know, may, hopefully, and you won't necessarily see these really, really gut wrenching things, but you should know that this is terrible, that, you know, when you think about World War II and you think about D-Day and what happens right after that uh, or any of the invasions, you know, you think about, you know, all these troops get on the beach and some die, but, you know, it's a triumph in the end. You know, meanwhile, in order to get that triumph, you're blowing the hell out of these, uh, in, in this case, in World War II's case, you're blowing the hell out of these villages, these little villages, you know, in France that are just being wiped out. Um you know, and all the people that are dying there, you know, hopefully many had, you know, escaped, but, um, you know, try to get the reality in, into all the books. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really important thing because some people, they're like, no, it has to be this long. That's, that's how long the story has to be because that's how it fits in the genre. It's like, well, but if you need that extra 10, 20, 40,000 words to really tell the story, to really you know, give it that feeling and that texture, as you were saying earlier, write the extra words because they will definitely be needed. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, it, it, unfortunately, they have to sell the book, too. And um, as someone I, this was had to do with a, this was a novel, you know, it was once uh, where I had a book that was kind of long and, uh, you know, the editor was saying well you know if you don't cut it down we can only get uh three copies of the paperback in the paperback racks rather than four in those you know uh, end caps and if we only get three rather than four it's not going to sell as many and blah 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 so there is a kind of a commercial you know end to that and the, the other thing i think that you know it's become kind of I think a lot of people are more apt to to uh, to pick up a, a shorter book these days, and that may just be my impression. But you know, I think that there's a general trend towards where once, like you know, a big thriller say would be you know, 120,000 words without blinking an eye. Now I think the trend is more towards you know, people wanting you know 85,000 words, you know, a, a shorter shorter quicker experience um and you know at the end of the day it's the the reader is making the call on what he or she wants so it's a delicate go balance with go with it well as part of that experience a lot of the military fans they want to have all the weapons and the equipment and the that's, ships that's true that's true and the jargon you want to you want to include that stuff um and if there's a cool rifle we want to know what it does we want to see it that's in true. action but that can really pump up the word count too, and that can mm -hmm. kind of bog down the pacing. So like as a writer, how do you get across that jargon and the weapons and stuff without going into too much detail? How do you find that balance? Well, I, there's a couple of different philosophies about that. The one that I kind of like and, and follow and have always followed in fiction as well is to kind of integrate to the extent possible, integrate it, you know, on a kind of need to know it basis and when it comes up like in the section you were talking about to, to talk about the A-10, the A-10A, for instance, and, you know, describing the airplane while it's in action and using some of the action to help uh, get some of that background in. Uh, and that's kind of the way that I've tried to do it, um, especially in even in, in things like Dream, the Dreamland um, fiction series, which was very, it was uh, those were high tech they're techno thrillers so there's a lot of high tech in there and people are picking it up for the tech uh i tried to integrate it the other way is um you know kind of the classic example would be in a tom clancy book where you would have four or five 
solid pages of just you know just minute description and all the action would stop you'd have minute description of you know of what uh, you know what he was talking about so he might spend three or four pages talking about you know every aspect of the a10 when i was developed etc cetera, etc cetera. um and that you know that's a different way of doing it and obviously it was very successful for him yeah i, I like how you you mention it real quick you kind of touch on it and then it'll be part of this part of the story later mm -hmm. it'll be part of the action um the other thing that I liked about this section was you do like show don't tell very well in, mm -hmm. in this section and that with someone who hasn't written a lot, it, they hear show don't tell and they're not sure what that means or what that looks like. So sometimes you kind of have to press the author to, to explain it. Yeah, I don't think yeah, I don't think of it in those terms precisely. I think of it more like, okay, if this were, this is what I would, would tell, you know, other writers, um, you know, how would you see it? If this is a movie, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Uh, what are you smelling? Uh, you know, where's your foot going? What's, what's that building like? Uh, so show me, show me what you're seeing, you know, put that, put yourself in that. If you're doing a point of view character, whether you're writing first person or you're writing uh, third person, um, or even third person omniscient, you know, what does it look like? You're there, show us through those eyes and communicate, you know, what you're seeing or what the movie camera is seeing, if that metaphor works for you. And um, there's certainly times when you want to tell, you know, you, you know, you want to give background and, you know, and you want to use, uh, you know, an authorial voice, you know, especially if you're writing a third person omniscient, you know, that, you know, if, to use that technique, you want to be telling, you know, you want that voice because you're doing, you're not just giving them the reader information. You are, you're setting a tone and you're kind of putting them in a certain direction in the head. You're doing some subtle things with that, you know, with that telling that you can't do just looking at, let's say the building or whatever. So, you know, so it's a judicious use of those things. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of how I think of it. Cause I, you know, I think you're right, Lauren, you know, some, sometimes, um, you, you know, outside of a writing class, you might not you'd be familiar with that, that term. And it's like, what do you mean show don't tell? I'm telling the whole, I'm telling you what happened. And people who are natural storytellers, they're, you know, they're telling you what happened. And if you listen to a natural storyteller, they're actually showing, <laughs> you know, in a way, it's just not on the page. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's how I think of it. You kind of talk it through and, and put them in the scene and get them to mm. verbalize it. Oh, and I like that you say, you know, telling has its place. You know, you can, you treat it just like you would any other aspect of the writing. Because I know there's a lot of authors that's like, I can't tell it all. Cut all the tells. And it's like, well, no, sometimes you yeah. do, you know, depending on the part. And that's just, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, every every writer is and every story is different. So, you know, there's times where that's I mean, if you couldn't tell, then you'd never have third person omniscience. So. Yeah. Another <laughs> kind of issue that comes up in the military uh, nonfiction is a lot of this stuff is classified and you can't talk about it. On page 93, he comes out and says, you know, here's a major event, but I really can't talk about it. Still, mm. it's classified. And you were mentioning that he went on ops that it, you kind of had to cut, gloss over somewhat. How do you navigate that? Uh, I don't write about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nope. uh, you don't write about it. Um, there's, that's just part of, you know, that's part of the, it's just that's just what it is. You don't write about it. Uh, the with with sniper, there's so much there's so much stuff that uh, you know that there's really no need. Uh, the 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 thing with many not all but many um, memoirs have to go through, especially someone that's been involved in those sorts of things, have to go through a, a kind of arduous uh, review from uh, starts at the Pentagon and would include all the intelligence agencies and all sorts of people, people um, you know, to make sure that there's nothing, you know, classified. And um, 
Oh, this thing really got scrutinized then. <laughs> oh yeah. So, so they did they was there anything they asked? You take out. Oh, you want me to tell you that, right? What they took. Well, you don't have to tell us what they asked. <laughs> well, I, while we're live on the internet, you know, for all to see. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There were there were a few things. I, I know pretty much at this point. I know pretty much what, um, you know, what you can what you can say, what you're not supposed to say. I can argue. You can make good arguments, but at the end of the day, it's their call, and you're not really. I certainly don't want to do anything that would put somebody in harm's way or, or screw up something. But on the other hand, you know, I did a biography of Omar Bradley as in World War II, a very important general. And my wife, who was research, did a lot of the research on that book, uh, found this trove, treasure trove of these photos that had never been used in the, one of the archives. Unfortunately, because they had never been used, because of where she found them, they had, well, they had never been used, they had never been declassified. So we had to go through this entire process to be able to use them. And let's see, what was that war? It was how many? 75 years ago? So we did get permission eventually, but you know, sometimes, sometimes I think they go to kind of great lengths. And they're just photos. You know, they're just, you know, they're not photos of, you know, missiles or anything. They're just of people. All but, right, so maybe you can't tell us whether or not Chris Kyle found any weapons of mass destruction while he was over there. Um, but maybe you could say, um, all right, so most lethal sniper in history, um, what do you think was motivating him to go over there to protect his country, to, to do his job, and then to tell his story? Well, first of all, I, I should point out that that Chris, if Chris hated, would 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 argue vigorously about whether he was the most quote unquote lethal sniper, and he would certainly say he wasn't the best sniper ever at all. Um, he was a really, really, really good shot and a really, really good sniper. But um, you know, his he he had he he would have a long list of of, of people. He attributed a lot of his success to the circumstances and where he was because he was in these huge battles. The uh, tactics at the time, um, because they were trying to avoid collateral damage, and um, the tactics at the time kind of favored snipers. Uh, and, you know, and he hated, hated to, would never himself use a real number, um, which is another little story we, we go into that a little bit in the book uh but his motivations were you know were god country and family those were his three highest values and one of the interesting things one of the kind of the dynamics in the book is that taya taya had has the same values but her pecking order was different her order was god family and country and that caused a lot of conflict with them and we do discuss that uh, in the in that book and also in American Wife. Um, he was, you know, he he, you know, so, you know, those were his rock core values, and um, and that's what. And you could see them not not just in war. I mean, he <laughs> he went out. Uh, there was a really really bad storm in um, in Texas where he was, and he he and uh, a friend went out, uh, and they're out they're out clearing trees from people's driveways. There was a big uh, hurricane where I live and um, <laughs> I went out to, we, I went out to check on the neighbors and crossing uh, the, the high, the kind of highway to go check on an older person. And my cell phone somehow was working and starts beeping. It's Chris from Texas wanting to know if uh, it's like five o'clock in the morning here. So it was really early there. And he's like, hey, do you need help? I'm going to like come up and, you know, he's, I think he like wanted to like jump in his truck and drive all the way up. And it's like, no, no, it's, it's, it's cool. I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. But, um, you know, that's, that's really kind of who he was. You know, I think that those things kind of drove him. And the other thing is that, you know, he, to a large extent, he saw 
a lot of the war, at least when he got into it, as being an adventure. And, you know, that excitement that you heard in the dune buggy story is, is totally Chris. It was like he loved and lived for action. And, you know, he loved helping people and all that. But he also it was, I mean, I don't know that war is ever really fun, but certainly you get an adrenaline rush. And he loved that adrenaline rush. And it's what he trained for. I mean, it's what every SEAL, what every, you know, and really most, certainly any combat infantry people, uh, other people in special operations, uh, pilots, anybody that's you know, kind of in that position, you know, that's that's their job. And they're, they're there for a reason. And when you get to do your job, whether you're a writer or you know, whatever, that's, that's why you're there and you like it. And if you don't like it, eventually you leave. I hope. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for telling his story and putting it out there. Um, you know, thank Chris for his service, but thank you for putting that service down on the page so that we could get a little peek into what it was like. My pleasure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. All right, everyone out there in the live YouTubes and the Facebooks, thank you so much for joining us. Oh my goodness, Jim, I I mean, I narrated that little bit and I, I myself too want to know even more and read deeper because you guys did such a good job at, it's not dry, you know, it, you're, it's all being no, loved with <laughs> in the moment. <laughs> so It's a lot of things, but not dry. It, I, I, give, it, uh, I mean, even a topic like this can be written just like, you know what I mean? And it, you, you guys just you put it in there and we become part of the story. And I love that. Um, so yeah, everyone ding the bell, hit the subscribe button. Um, check us out at the Keystroke Medium Group on Facebook, on the MeWees, on the Discords, all the places. Um, yeah, and be sure to check us out next week where we're going to be talking about more reading writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Good afternoon, you guys. <laughs>